Today's top story from the perspective of someone who's there. You are looking live. This just in. Not my beat. Joining us now is Ava Wallace from the Washington Post, their Wizards beat reporter. Ava, uh, just big picture yesterday, walking out of, uh, was it District E that we were at? Um, what's kind of your big takeaway from what everybody said and, and the whole event there at, uh, at Gallery Place? It certainly felt like a different vibe to me, honestly. It, it felt really fresh and really new, and that's kind of what you get when you finally break away from the Grunfeld era and, and bring in guys who are, have experiences at places like Golden State and Atlanta and OKC and the LA Clippers. Like It, it felt very fresh to me. It felt like a good start. I, I kind of left feeling like if I were a Wizards fan, I would at least start allowing myself to maybe consider being excited about this company. <laughs> yeah. That was, that was so couched, <laughs> so tepid. Maybe just, you like, would I consider... I, I got a lot of trauma too, so... I, yeah. yeah. But start thinking about it is all I would say. It was a, it was a promising first start for sure. For sure. And, and the thing that I walked away from, and we obviously got to sit down with Winger and with Dawkins. I know you got a little bit of time with both of them as well, is like the young, you know, Ted said, like, you know, I was looking for a, a new next generation executive and like these guys, it's their time. And to me, they really embody that. And it, someone, I mean, look, Will Dawkins is three years older than I am and just kind of, the, which is also great. Like, what am I doing? I guess, I guess hosting right. afternoon drive is not terrible, but I mean, yeah. he's an NBA GM. Um, so the, the kind of way they just approach the conversations with us, the way they generally approach everything, I feel like was very new age. What struck you about that and kind of the generational difference between these guys and say a Tommy Shepard or Ernie, Ernie Grunfeld before it, uh, before Absolutely. Him. It was really struck. I kept thinking about, um, who is going to kind of be the new face of this front office, the new face of this iteration of the wizards. Is it going to be Wes Unsell Jr. Who's staying on his coach? Is it going to be, um, Michael Winger? And it seemed to me like if I had to pick based off yesterday alone, I would pick Will Dawkins. He's the new GM coming over from OKC. Like you said, he's 37. To, to your credit though, you did not have to live in Oklahoma for 15 years. So there is that. That is true. No shots to Oklahoma, but that was um, kind of a shot at Oklahoma. That City, was like a which is like shot. a, like you a have to fine. Say, I apologize to everyone. Anyways. Yeah, it's a fine place to go <laughs> for not fifteen years. Yes, there you go. Um, but he kind of struck me as the guy who he had a couple of lines ready. He he was clearly very comfortable in front of the cameras. Uh, he had a good relationships with a lot of reporters, a lot of agents, and kind of people who are milling about the room. Um, he was a broadcast journalism major, which I was just like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. He said, thank you for the questions. I was like, don't butter me up because it'll work. But um, <laughs> yeah, it definitely seemed like he was going to be the guy who maybe was a little bit comfortable with being more forward facing in the Wizards and Michael Winger really seemed like he was definitely excited to kind of share his thinking and how um, he was kind of starting to piece his plans together but he definitely seemed to me at least from from what I gathered yesterday like someone who would kind of stay in the shadows and be kind of masterminding from from up above and, and behind the scenes whereas he's got a great group of executives now who can step in front of the camera and explain to people hey here's what's happening um so that was that was kind of interesting. I could I could kind of see and envision down the line how this would work from a media standpoint and from a messaging standpoint for sure. Yeah, it feels like we'll get winger. Like I mean, he'll do you know the the random interviews, whatever. But like when they have a draft press conference, it feels like Dawkins is going to be the guy, and like that's what they want day to day operations. And it's it's more his, and the scouting stuff is more him and Schlank, and obviously winger has opinions. How do you feel like Wes fits in with them? Because that that's another thing I've always kind of thought about. Wes is he's kind of similar in demeanor, um, the way he approaches about thing or approaches things, the way he talks about things, I feel like isn't too dissimilar, um, to, to these two guys, but you've had a lot more experience with Wes than I have. So what do you make of how Wes fits in? Yeah, it was so funny. It was very clear that Michael Winger and, and Will Dawkins, um, back from their OKC days have a good relationship off the bat. That's what Will Dawkins, I kind of asked him, I said, you know, you're 37, really sharp guy. Like, why are you signing on to come work under somebody when once you get I know there are only so many GM jobs in the league I said basically but it, Michael Winger also yesterday said it, when the decisions are made it is my final decision so I asked him who wants to come and, and be someone's number two and he said what I wanted to be here for was to work with Michael Winger and to be in this market but mostly it was his relationship that he had with Michael and he said he was really really excited to work under someone as sharp who had such deep relationships with agents all of the things that Ted Leonsis is this kind of uh, been saying are, are the things that he made him attracted to Michael Winger in the first place. Um, 
So yeah, it was like, you kind of saw that group stick together and say, okay, these guys have prior relationships. Travis Schlank was, uh, Winger actually called him when he was working in the Clippers and said, you know, I might have something for you after Schlank got uh, let go in Atlanta. And that's how he kind of ended up here. But Wes doesn't really have really strong relationships with those guys. So it's kind of, he's the last kind of vestige of the old guard showing up and saying, you know, I know this city, I know these people, I know basketball. Um, so I think it'll be interesting to see how he meshes with him. Vibes wise, I can see, I mean, Wes Unsell Jr. is an easy guy to get along with. He's a straight shooter. He's very serious. He takes himself seriously. He's got a good sense of humor. Um, so I, I can definitely see that, but that's going to be kind of the main relationship that has to grow. And I think, I think it'll be easier for him to make those relationships happen when he knows he's not kind of dealing with three disparate opinions in Schlenk, Winger, and Dawkins. Like, it does seem like those three guys will be on the same page and making opinions. And I think that makes it a lot easier for someone else to come in rather than say, like, oh, I got to talk like this to this guy and say this to this so he doesn't tell the other guy. Like, when the three people who have the good relationship are already together, it makes it easier for one to come in from the outside, I think, in a, in a business setting. Yeah. Ava Wallace with us from the Washington Post here on the Hoffman Show on the Team 980. Um, and for whatever it's worth, Wes mentioned this yesterday. I know um, Winger did as well. Winger interviewed Wes for the Clippers job when they eventually mm -hmm. hired Ty Lue. Um, so like, they have talked before, but not yeah. obviously worked together. Um, I, let, let's just stick with the, the West and the basketball stuff for a second. I want to circle back to like the bigger picture stuff, but Wes said something to me yesterday when he was on with us. Um, and it, I'm, he might've said it other places as well. So I'm not trying to just like take credit, but he, I, he, he said it to me in our interview because I asked him about basically Bradley and, and the, like, if you keep him, what's the way that he fits into a championship level basketball team? Like what's his role? What's his usage? And how do you, how do you conform that to be? you know, more successful in terms of winning basketball games. And he talked about the modernization and he had mentioned this in another answer as well, but modernization of their kind of basketball philosophy he talked about their shot diet. And for Brad specifically, he's like, he's got to take more threes. And I know that last year, like Tommy seemed to be very much behind putting the ball in Brad's hands and making him this quasi point guard. And, you know, obviously you can do both. Dame takes a lot of threes. Steph takes a lot of threes. Technically, they're point guards. Um, but wh what do you make of that comment? Not just like the correctness of it from an analysis basketball standpoint, but the fact that he clearly has this idea. He's the head coach. And there was something in the way of him implementing it sooner. I, I don't even know if that's what I would take away from that comment, although there might have been. I think the biggest thing that's in the way of allowing Bradley Beal more open space and and more time to kind of maneuver and take threes is that they they haven't had a point guard as good as John Wall. Like when people started talking about Bradley Beal needing to take more threes, he was playing alongside John Wall. And at that point, yes, he should have been taking more threes because John Wall could set him up better than any just about any point guard in the NBA at that point. They haven't had a John Wall since, I mean, Russell Westbrook, of course. Um, but since Westbrook left, they haven't had someone where Brad can actually kind of take his foot off the gas in terms of being a ball handler and actually just kind of fully embrace his shooter mentality. So I understand what Wes is saying there, but I do think you're missing pieces if that's what you're trying to do. Um, especially when you do have other shooters like Corey Kispert kind of on the floor. And I know that they, he didn't pray, play with Brad um, super consistently last season, but when you talk about modernizing the NBA, I don't think that all falls on Bradley Beal's shoulders. I think you have to look at the group that you're working with there. And that's something that you need Will Dawkins to help you with. Like you need all the scouts who've been working all year and, and looking at this draft. So um, I totally understand what he's saying, but I think that's a hard thing to do when you don't have the right pieces on the floor and you can't just do it with one guy. Like Bradley Beal's too good at creating his own shots to say you have to only think about shooting threes when there's no one else on the floor who is as good at kind of being the in between one and two guard as well. Yeah. When talk in terms of like shot diet and, and then I asked about the defensive side and, and he said, you know, we got, there's a lot of stuff, obviously he's like, we did some good things, but you know, we have to be more consistent effort, you know, attention to detail, all the things that you'd expect um, as someone who covered basically every game and talked to Wes after uh, everyone that you were there for, like how much of that is, I, I'm trying to not use the word indictment of him as a coach, but I guess I don't know how else to say it. Like an indictment of him and his inability to take these ideas that he clearly has and, and get his players to do that versus he didn't have the horses. Like it was a roster construction issue or there were other forces inserting different ideas. Like how do you kind of 
you know, separate that, not necessarily to just hammer people with blame, but to identify how they can fix that moving forward? I think um, it's never just one or the other. It's always a little bit of it's on the coach to kind of get his guys to pay attention and and more than get his guys and explain in a way like really win the locker room. Because it's not like these NBA players are not understanding what Wes Until Jr. is telling them. It's does he have the locker room or not? And then the second thing is, I don't know if you would say that West Central Jr. had the best roster for what he wanted to implement in terms of how many two-way players does he have. How many, I mean, really strong two-way players who can go and defend. And it's obviously an extremely hard thing to do in the NBA to defend for an entire game and then run back and, and be brilliant on offense as well. But I think it's going to be a little bit of both. Um, and in terms of how you go ahead fixing that, I think when the front office and the coaching staff are on the same page, how you implement a player like Daniel Gafford on defense, that gets solved. That's something that you can hash out. Or if you decide, hey, we actually want to bring in a different type of player completely for what we want to do. That's something that irons itself out when everybody's on the same page in terms of the overarching direction of the Washington Wizards. Um, And that's what we've been told is exactly what Michael Winger is here for, to say this is to to give this team an identity, really. So once you have an identity in terms of here's how we want to be, it's way easier to draft the player, the type of players that you need. It's way easier to tell those players exactly what they'll be doing from the get go. So they want to listen to the coach later on. Like it's a trickle down effect when when the uh, front office and the coaching staff are not on the same page. Definitely. Um, Ava Wallace with us from the Washington Post. Um, I wanted to to check in with you on a quote that Ted gave Grant and Danny yesterday. Um, he was, I guess he was asked about Tommy um, and kind of why now for the change in the whole deal. And he said, I don't like terminating executives, but when you present a plan that everyone believes in and then you make a different decision and that snowballs, that's what ends up with multiple bad decisions. Do you have any idea what he's talking about there? Just in terms of like what decision, what plan did he make? I'll read the quote again because I've read it now in in front of me, you know, five times and I still not sure exactly what he's talking about. He goes, I don't like terminating executives, but here's the the crux of it. When you present a plan that everyone believes in and then you make a different decision and that snowballs, that's what ends up with multiple bad decisions. So what's the plan that everyone believed in and what's the different decision that Tommy made? that all of a sudden leads to this diversion where he is gone? That I'm not sure, but I can't think of one specific thing that he's talking about where it's like, we all agreed to draft this one guy and then we ended up with a different guy, something like that. Um, I also, I mean, you and I have both been in press conferences with Ted Leotis before, like sometimes his quotes, you have to really dig for actually what he means or really think about it for a while. So um, I don't know if that's something I'm going to be able to pull if he was referring to (laughs) a specific thing or anything like that. Um, but I, I do think it just goes back to the fact that everybody knew that this front op- this front office not just wasn't on the same page with the coaching staff always. And, you know, I, in reporting that out, I've done – people will tell you different things of, no, it's not a fight. It's not a disagreement. It's, a, it's, it's just like a difference of opinion that we're working out, which happens in every single NBA club. Sure. Like, that's super, super normal. Um, but when the front office isn't on the same page the way that it's now pretty well known that Sashi Brown and, and Tommy Shepard were not – I don't know if that's what he's talking about, but it just helps to have one person at the top. Like the thing I wrote about today in kind of, excuse me, in kind of explaining the structure of this front office and why it's different from maybe monumental basketballs of the past, because you still have the structure where you've got someone who is a president. That was Sasha Brown supposed to be. He was supposed to be the big picture guy and tell me how these basketball teams are going to work. And Tommy Shepard was going to do the GM. So on paper, this new structure is pretty similar. But what's different is you hired one person at the top, not Sashi and Tommy working equally. And you let the guy at the top make the hires below him. So you're not just throwing a bunch of, you know, grown men executives together and saying, okay, now you guys work together. You're saying, I'm bringing in people who I want to work with, who I know kind of think the same way as me, or if they don't have ideas that I value and experiences that I value. Um, So I think that's going to make a huge difference in terms of how decisions like that get made. Um, Again, I just can't stress enough in, in all this kind of confusion. And even Will Dawkins said himself, like, it's going to be janky. We're going to be stepping on some people's toes until we figure it out. And that's okay. But for Michael Winger to come out and say, that's true. And the final decision is mine. 
Right. That makes a difference. Yeah. He, uh, it's so funny when he was adamant yesterday and he like stepped in after a great answer from Will about the, the kind of dispersal yeah, of responsibilities. And he was like, just to be clear, the final, and he was saying the final decision is mine, not as like a power play, but as an accountability thing. Like yes, at the end of the day, account. yeah, at the end of the day, like if things go wrong and then he kind of, you know, quietly dropped a line that Sean McVay uses all the time um, in the NFL where he's like, if it goes right, it's your credit. And he's pointing to Dawkins. If it goes wrong, it's my fault. And that's mm-hmm. how Sean, I remember when he was here as the offensive coordinator and I covered him, he always talked about that with, with players. He's like, yeah. if it goes right, I won't take any credit. It's all the players. They made it happen. If it goes wrong, it's my fault. And now yeah. sometimes, you know, you get them off the record. You, and this happens. A lot of coaches, they'll give you a little bit more honesty about a certain thing. It's like, yeah, we had the right play call and this guy ran the wrong route or whatever, but like public comments, any, anything. And, and that the way that keeps a team together, like that, the fact that they understand that I think is essential. And that's obviously, I think why probably a guy like Will Dawkins was very happy to leave Sam Presti, which is a big thing and go work for Michael Winger. Sure. Yeah, exactly. And, and like you said, just to kind of start things off on that foot at the introductory press conference and make it really clear from the get go, um, is going to help set the tone. I think of what had been a very muddled top of an organization. It just, it seems a lot more clear, at least to me now. I hope I tried to explain what everyone does. Um, the only person who I, I'm not still quite sure is John Thompson, the third, who, who was hired, uh, promoted to be senior vice president of monumental basketball. And, and I asked him what that means yesterday. And he said, everybody else has a pretty distinct lane. I'm the only one who doesn't. I'm kind of going to be helping whoever needs help with whatever they need. So if he's being deputized to help uh, Michael Winger kind of shoulder the load of these three clubs here, that's, yeah. So that's gonna be interesting. he can be the institutional knowledge guy. Um, sure. you know, that, <laughs> Hey, how do, where's that, where's the box of things? Uh, right. that's, that's Sean Thompson's job. <laughs> Some, sometimes, like- yeah, sometimes literally sometimes proverbially where's the box of things. Um, yeah. that is the other thing that I think really struck me yesterday was just how authoritative winger was and not and again in like a, uh, power has gone to his head kind of way, but even sitting right next to Ted Leonsis, sitting next to your billionaire boss. And when asked, do you have the ability to completely tear it down? The kind of direct question that is almost grandstandy in the way it was asked yesterday, um, in a way that like puts the wizards fans who were out for blood, like, yes, that's the question. Um, and the fact that winger didn't you know, sidestep the question. Well, we don't know what our plan is yet. You know, whatever. He just was like, yes, I do. I have full authority. And to not even look at Ted, not whatever. Like to me, that was a moment yesterday. And also again, I don't really have a question here. Just kind of continuing the conversation along the the grounds that we've been going on. That to me, like was another prime example of just how clear the power structures, the responsibilities, and these things that have been very messy are now under this new front office. Yeah, I think the the big moment for me, I, I agree that was one. And, and I agree also that he sounded very self-assured without, it, to me, it sounded like he was confident in his thinking and his opinions without feeling like he needed to have answers yet. Like there were a lot of, I don't know yet mm-hmm. yesterday. Um, you know, Will Dawkins said many times he got into town Wednesday night and the press conference was Thursday at noon. So he was just like, I can tell you how I look at this thing. I haven't looked at this specific thing yet, so I don't know. But I, I always appreciate, especially as a journalist, when someone like, don't, I would so much rather you just say, I don't know, than make up an answer. That's totally fine. And I, I um, it was really interesting to me when someone asked if Bradley Beal, Kristaps Porzingis, and Kyle Kuzma will be here at training camp. He said, I don't know. And part of that was because he he made sure to say, you know, Kristaps Porzingis and Kyle Kuzma have the power there because of free agency and the player option. So he kind of couched it in that a little bit, but I do appreciate that he didn't just say, well, Bradley Beal's an incredible player and da-da-da. he didn't dodge it. He said, I don't know. I have to look at it. And and that's something that we're still looking at. And to me, that's someone who has, like you said, not just the, um, the belief of ownership behind them, but also a lot of self-assuredness to not say, I'm going to tell you people what you want to hear right now, but just honesty. It was good. Yeah. Ava Wallace with us for another minute here on the team 980. Last thing I'll ask you about is exactly that with Beal specifically. Will went as far to say with us that like, there's no decision to be made on Bradley Beal. He's under contract. Mm -hmm. Um, They clearly have not had a chance to sit down as a group yet and discuss what they want to do with this roster. 
However, they've been watching the NBA for and, and working in it for a long time. They know what's up. There's there's only so much to talk about. They all clearly somewhere deep inside them have an idea of of what needs to happen. Um even if they haven't, you know, wanted to verbalize that yet. So I guess my question is, how much do you believe them? How much do you believe that they really don't know versus they deep down really know and they all just need to say it to each other in a room so that they can be on the same page? Um I think I think they all have some ideas, but they haven't gotten a chance to really dive into anything yet. Like that's, I, I genuinely believe that. And, and I'm sure they all um, have their opinions of Bradley Beal and know him very well. He's been in the league for a long time. When they say there's no decision to be made, he's not entirely wrong. The guy's got a no trade clause. So I, I could see, I could see you saying like, technically it's one of those things where it's like, it's accurate, but it's not true. Yeah. Um, but, it did, but it I, did make me reshape my question when I asked, cause we had Dawkins first and when I asked sure. Winger about it. I was like, Will said there's no decision to be made, but there's a decision to make on every player. That's the nature of an off season. And that mm-hmm. kind of that, that got us past that gate. And I got a little bit more insight from Michael than I did from Will. But you know, in that yeah. sense, like exactly what you're saying. No, there's absolutely a decision to be made. I mean, I I think there's a decision to be made on every single part of this organization. And that's what they said yesterday. Like they are starting from the ground up and they are going peg by peg and seeing which pieces fit together. I thought it was really interesting that aside from this new front office, pretty much everybody who's worked for the Wizards for the past couple of seasons who hasn't already left for other jobs, um, the few people that have were there. I mean, with, uh, Wes Unsell Jr.'s entire coaching staff was there. The G, one of the G League assistant coaches was there. The, the um, GoGo general manager was there. All of the PR staff and people who worked for Tommy Shepard and everything, everybody was there, um, which made me think that they just haven't started yet. Because, it, you know, I, w- I was kind of like going in ready to have my pen and paper out and make notes of who's still there and, and who's sticking around and everything. But when everybody's there, that just means decisions haven't been made. Yeah. Ava Wallace. Except for, except for players, I would say. No players. There. That was interesting. And some of that is like guys get out of town. Like it's been months I'm since sure the season. Um, but I kind of figured of like. Stuff too. Yeah. I, 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 I was. That was curious, especially because like NFL press conferences, when they introduce new head coaches and stuff, there's a lot of guys that are there, even guys that will don't wind up playing for that head coach because they get introduced in January and then they get cut in February. But like I did notice that that was bizarre to me that like I was kind of surprised Bradley wasn't there, to be honest. (laughs) <laughs> for the radio audience who is not watching this on YouTube, that was a big shoulder shrug from Ava. Uh, Ava Wallace, Washington Post, with us here on The Hoffman Show. I always appreciate your time, man. Thank you. Thanks so much.